Thanks very much for uh, having us this afternoon and uh, taking time out to hear what we have to say. I think a question that all of us that are seeking to deploy capital, how do you sort through opportunities and prioritize opportunities because you only have so much time? And then secondly, how do you allocate the capital that you have? So I guess the question I'd ask the panel is sorting and allocating. Can you talk to that a little bit? Christina, can you start? Sure. Um, you know, from a sorting perspective, I, I ultimately choose to spend time and invest in entrepreneurs that I like. Um, so I think, honestly, a lot of a lot of my decisions about where I allocated my time or, or how good is the relationship that I have with the person that that I'm interacting with. Um, and uh, you know, I, I spend all day meeting with entrepreneurs, and I love meeting love meeting new people. But ultimately, you know, I can I can probably decide in the first three to five minutes of a meeting. You know, is this going well? Is this something someone that I could see myself building a long-term relationship with? Um, and that, so that's very important to me in terms of where I want to spend time. You know, helping whether it's helping people out or looking more deeply at a deal or you know considering an investment. Um, I think that often plays into how I allocate my time. Um, in terms of allocating capital, um, from an angel perspective, I mean, angels, you know, I certainly hope no one angel invests because they think they're going to make a lot of money off of it. You're ultimately doing it because there's something else that you're getting out of it, hopefully some sort of intrinsic motivation you have. So um, I think you end up allocating your capital more based on, you know, who are the, who are the people and the opportunities and the places you feel you can learn from and, and help the most. Um, from, a, from a Samsung perspective, um, you know, we are very focused on the sectors where we feel we can um, provide the most strategic collaboration opportunities to companies. And so keeping a very close eye on what are the businesses that we support with between mobile, consumer, um, electronics, and display, what are the projects and products that are really important to Samsung where we feel we can bring added value through the startups that, that we know and facilitate those introductions and, um, and those collaborations. So, um, we try to focus our, our investments into companies where we feel like we can have a, a significant strategic impact. You got to. Christian. Yeah, I mean, I answered the question a little bit before. I think when we um, invest in a company, we, you know, we, we take all our energy to, to make this company successful because we are strategic. We wouldn't invest in one, two, three uh, companies that are all doing the same just because we think that hatches our risks the best, in the best way and then the financial uh, return is the highest, but we really uh, put our energy and resources behind this one company that is solving this one problem that we believe will be uh, will, is, is important uh, for our future customers um, to have a solution to. Um, so, you know, to the sorting, um, I think it's a little bit easier for us because we have a, quite a niche sector. We are in a transportation space, we are in mobility service space, so there's a B2C component to it and a, a transportation component to it. It needs to be a little bit premium. It couldn't just be, be anything. So the sorting is, is kind of uh, made by, uh, by definition of what we invest and what we don't invest. But uh, um, the resources, uh, this is a really interesting question and it's really more matrix. If you look at the, the stage of the company, they have definitely a different need in a seed stage versus a series C. So in our company that is hopefully uh, getting profitable soon has totally different um, asks to BMWs than a company that has three people um, working on an app in a basement kind of deal. Um, and we try to be smart about it and then allocate the resources for each company in the um, stage that they require. So obviously marketing is kind of the first low hanging fruit in the early stage, but then later on real business deals really helping them navigate a very complex OEM world. And um, so yeah, we try to uh, find a solution for each company and put the right resources uh, to work. Gotcha. Imran, you want to comment? Sure, yeah. Um, I'll just say quick, you know, I think in terms of the sorting question, you know, when, 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 you, um, when I entered venture capital, you know, the, one of the first things I was told is that you want to kill deals quickly. Um, and so I think, you know, from my firm specifically, you know, we get a lot of inbound requests and, and sort of our goal as part of the due diligence team is to really find what's wrong with the company so that we can just move on to the next one. That's ultimately what we're trying to do. Um, if it makes it past the first, first stage of diligence, then we'll continue to, to investigate it. Um, but ultimately we're looking for, for what's wrong with the company so we can move on because we get so many inbound requests. And so that, that sorting question is actually a very important one. Um, but I would also echo what my, my co-panelists have said in terms of management team. That's something that's really important. We've already, already hit on that. Um, I think another point in, uh, to mention, I think is also echoing what my co-panelists said, is just um, our, our level, involve, level of involvement with the company. Um, we often will take a uh, board seat in the companies 
And for those, for when we take a board seat, that, that, that's a sort of, um, you know, we're, we're actually deploying a bit of our time as well. And so we usually make a more significant investment in terms of capital, but we also will put our time um, with respect to sitting on the boards. Um, so, but yeah, I guess I'll stop there. That sounds great. So uh, first, if anybody in the audience has a question, please, by all means. Uh, but this next question kind of hits home for me. Uh, when Johnson Controls approached us to buy our business, they wanted majority control. So one of the questions I have to the panel is, do you invest as a majority or a minority? And related to that, how do you preserve the secret sauce of the companies that you invest in? And this is probably particular to uh, Samsung Ventures and uh, BMW Ventures, because you're investing assets on behalf of the corporations that you serve. So question. Um, so we, we are minority investors. Uh, we don't hold more than 20% of any company that we invest in. We're not looking to be majority shareholders. We don't want to run the company. We're trusting that in the, in the management team. Um, I think, sorry, what was the other half of the question? It's uh, minority or majority. Right. And then if uh, majority, oh, how do protection. you preserve the secret sauce? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a challenge. I mean, you know, Samsung, is a, it, Samsung Electronics is a huge you know, multinational conglomerate. It's, um, you know, there's lots of teams working on lots of different projects. And I could know about three teams that are working on a, a project in a given area. And there are three more that I've never, I've never interacted with that are also working on it. Um, in some way, so uh, so you know, part of my job is to stay on top of what's happening across the relevant business units and and know what they're working on at any given time, um, so that I have that information to be able to share appropriately within my team and then with our portfolio. But I, more than anything, I'm actually protective of my portfolio more so than I than I am of the corporate. Um, you know, I think you know if you if you have worked with or or for or in startups. Um, you know that you know there's so there's so much blood, sweat, and tears that goes into you know building these these early stage companies, and um, they really need more protection than anything else. So um, I spend a lot of time actually trying to sort of push back and make sure that um, I can be a little bit of a gatekeeper um, to um, you know uh, give some comfort I think to the startups that when they work with us, um, we're not looking to pass on you know their IP or you know details of something that was discussed in a board meeting to the team that's working on a relevant project in the same area. Um, that, that level of trust is really important to instill with a management team early on. Um, so that's something that we focus very, very specifically on. Christian, you care. Yeah, so, so very similar um, for us. We own between 1% to 20% in the companies that we have in our portfolio today. Um, I think it's very important to understand that you don't have control over the startup. It's very different from M&A. It's not M&A, even though you might own 20%. It's not the same thing as owning 20% of a, let's say, supplier traditionally or so. Um, and that's very important because it sets expectations for you know, corporate strategy, corporate finance, and all the functions that are normally engaged um, in, a, in a corporate VC or at least in the background. So um, we, we did that. And um, Imran earlier said uh, he takes board seats. We try to take observer seats. I think it's that's our personal opinion of BMW Ventures. I think it's not a good idea for corporate VCs to have a board seat. Um, it creates a lot of problems down the road. So observer seat, if, if you want to be closer to the company, is a, is a better way to go. Um, yeah, it's so a secret sauce. I think all the things I just said, also preserving and protecting the secret sauce of the company. If you, if you want to involve your corporate strategy guys, your corporate product guys, and all those uh, guys in the startup, then you know you should have done it yourself before. So, you know, don't involve those people. Let the startup do what they do best, uh, innovating and uh, create the best uh, new product. And uh, that's actually much harder for the corporation. That goes back to the control issue, but uh, it's very hard also to to I guess uh, have the processes to to do that and not. Um, and, and not have uh, sort of overwhelmed by, uh, by the corporation. And there are always four teams working on the same thing. And they all, uh, if it com comes bad to bad, they all want to talk to the startup and all do cool stuff with the startup. But the teams are probably all five times as big as the startup itself. So you have to be the gatekeeper. Um, Let's talk about the issue of valuation. So you find a company that you're interested in investing in. And Imran, this would maybe be particular in your area with healthcare. Uh, valuations are pretty high. Uh, the entrepreneur is very proud of what they've accomplished. You're interested in investing. 
How do you rationalize the valuation? And secondly, are you concerned about a bubble? Mm, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, I, I'll make a few comments on that. I think one is um, that we, it's really important for us to invest in companies that we think have fundamental value. Um, so for us, we, you know, we're not going to invest in a company based upon sentiment. You know, the markets are going crazy, and you know, oh, well, this company seems likely to be successful because you know the, the, it has a high valuation. Just throw our money in there. And we have to really believe in the fundamental value of the company, um, so that when if, if the market does go down, it does have a correction as we as we've actually seen in the last couple of weeks, um, last few weeks within uh, within biotech and healthcare, um, that there's actually going to be value there. Um, and so, so I think that's the first point. I think. You know, the other thing I would mention is that we're very flexible in terms of our strategy. Um, so in, in, in environments where, you know, say, say it's a down market, um, we might invest in later stage companies because um, their valuations might be a little bit repressed. So we might go for, you know, phase two, phase three data companies um, because they're relatively cheaper. So we can actually, and they're, and they're, and they're relatively de-risked. We can actually put our money in later stage companies that are more de-risked. However, in a, in a market where, they're, you know, it's, it's rising and rising and rising like we've like we been seeing in the last several years, um, we might go earlier stage because at that the earlier stage is where you can get lower valuations and then you can still potentially see a return on your investment in, in the range that we, that we need to see. Uh, I wouldn't say that we would totally avoid the later stage companies that are priced at a, you know, priced higher. Um, so for example, we've invested in one of these, these mezzanine types of rounds and, and made a return on these rounds. Um, but I think that we just maintain our flexibility to, main, um, to look at different types of investments. In an upper market, maybe earlier stage investments, we can get the valuations that we want. Um, in a down market, we can get the more de-risked assets and later stage development. Care to comment? Christian or Christina? Uh, you know, at the early stage, the challenge is that you, you, know, you, can't, you, you, know, you can't do a, a discounted cash flow. I mean, you can, I was looking at a, at a company's projections uh, that doesn't currently have any product. Uh, a company is projecting $2 billion in sales in four years. Um, you know, I, I look at I look at those spreadsheets. And I just don't know what to do with them. I mean, I, I I usually look at projections just to see if the if the entrepreneur is crazy or not. Because you know, are they do they are their assumptions reasonable? This one was not. Um, but you know, ultimately, your the valuation is really more a reflection of how big you think this company can get. Um, you know, if you invest it at you know five or ten or twenty million dollars, can they build a hundred, two hundred, three hundred million dollar company? Um, and so it ultimately, it comes back to looking at looking at the market opportunity, looking at the competition. You know canvassing the landscape and determining whether or not this company really has the product, the team, the timing to get, you know, to big enough scale that, you know, I can, I can meet my return hurdles. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, uh, you get more sensitive as you move further out the, the investment curve. Uh, early stage, uh, a lot of times it's just, uh, you know, is it completely crazy or is it fairly reasonable and you know, go from there. Yeah, I guess the public question, I guess that's something we hear a lot. Um, I don't think we're in the bubble. I don't think we're like in the bubble bubble that we saw in 1990 or so, in 1999 or so. Um, we are definitely in something, um, who knows what, but uh, I think that we create a lot of value right now. I think we invest way more in healthcare, way more in uh, improving government, improving how you know people can communicate to governments. Uh, education is, is, is a big investment area. I think because we invest a lot of in, in those areas, uh, I'm a little bit more positive about the trends right now because there is value created and Uber, you know, you can argue about the valuation and those things, but it's changing businesses dramatically. It's uh, taking car ownership out. It's, uh, it's actually moving people around. So it's not just a photo sharing app or something like that. So um, there is value created if, if it's worth $52 billion. That's another question. But, uh, you know, I know that investors believe that Uber is worth $200 billion eventually. So there's still some some room, I guess. Um, you know, we we don't we're not that um, valuation sensitive anymore. <laughs> I guess the market trained us a little bit. Um, if we want to be part of the big rounds, then we cannot be uh, valuation sensitive. But uh, often we uh, we argue and we try to uh, you know have some reason in there. I think what I'm worried about is uh, companies that are traditional businesses and call for valuations of tech companies. That's something I see a lot, which uh, that's, a, that's a very dangerous path. And if I could actually add on to that, I just really want to echo exactly what he said within the healthcare sector. Um, people are t always talk about a bubble, and you know that, that's always sort of a floating question that's out there. But the thing that I would highlight is that 
um, there really has been fundamental value that has been created, particularly in healthcare. For example, if you look at immuno-oncology, um, we are actually extending patients' lives who've had these basically uncurable cancers. Um, hepatitis C, we basically, you know, Gilead developed a drug which essentially cures hepatitis C. You see gene therapy, that's actually, you know, spark therapeutics as an example, that's produced some really positive results. So I think it's really a lot of the, a lot of the, the increase in valuations have actually been driven by what I would argue is fundamental value. So I would just echo that for healthcare. Question. Uh, actually, it's not a question. It's a comment about the uh, two points of view as to whether you become a board member or not. Um, I'm not an expert in this, but I did advise the client uh, on the subject. And as a board member, you have a fiduciary duty to the, to the company. Uh, and it means if you know of opportunities that your company that on whose board you're sitting could make use of, you have a duty to bring that to the board. Uh, and a lot of uh, people who sit on lots of boards don't want to hear this. And there are solutions for it in some states like Delaware where you can write this out of your charter. But in my case, the two big uh, other members of the board uh, who had the majority uh, didn't want to hear about it. And they wanted my little client to be forced to bring his new innovations to the company. Uh, the same thing uh, as an observer, just because you're an observer doesn't mean you don't have a duty of confidentiality. So you have to figure out how much can you take from the board meetings that you're sitting in on and share with your colleagues. It's not automatic. So uh, I know this, this world is different from the normal M&A world, but you're still playing by the same rules, uh, the same corporate laws that apply more or less in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. So. Uh, I find it remarkable how often this gets ignored in the, um, I'm not saying you're ignoring it, but I'm saying in my experience, these were two big name companies uh, that were on the board and they didn't want to hear about it. Yeah, and that's exactly the reason why we don't take board seats and, you know, we have a kind of Chinese wall between the corporate headquarter and what we are doing because of what you said, what you described. I th we think it's very important that companies uh, know that and companies can trust us. Otherwise, you, you, don't, uh, you don't get the best deals if companies think, yeah, everything you tell the VC is going back to headquarters and they're building their own service or you know, whatever you can do with those information. Um, so yeah, uh, we, we never sign an NDA because uh, it's not how the VC world work, works. Um, that's a trust issue, it's a relationship issue. And later on, on the business side, we sign NDAs then obviously, but um, uh, I think that's, that's really the most important piece also for corporate VCs learning the new ways of doing business in a startup world versus the old world without forgetting those fundamental, um, you know, I guess, uh, house rules. I think uh, the comment about board seat is right on target. Uh, whenever I make an investment, I always follow the money, get on the board. And one particular board, there were other board members. Uh, one of them was Qualcomm Ventures. And uh, it got to a point uh, of friction with management uh, first, they said, we'd like you to become the CEO, and I did not want to do that. I had just done that. And then secondly, they, uh, they were sitting board members, not active board members, and uh, they said, if you can get your money back, um, we would if we could. And, and I was able to, so at least they, they stood up. But we did address everything as a true fiduciary, and I think when you're putting your money or other people's money at risk, following that money and getting involved to make sure that uh, the intention of making the investment and the way in which the money's deployed is followed through is exactly right on. And you have to, you have, to have a fiduciary role. Um, so that's a counterpoint. I understand what you're saying, Christian, but I, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm on the opposite side of the ledger on that one. Do you have a comment, Imran? Yeah, I mean, I, I I would agree. I think you know we you know when we when we do take a board seat, you know we're, we're very aware of that dynamic, and I think that you know, even with within our firm, we do have um, you know some you know, like you say Chinese wall set up as well between different members of the teams who might be working in companies that might have something somewhat related to another company. So we definitely set up those barriers as well. Um, but yeah, no, I, I guess I would probably fall on that side in terms of being actively you know very actively involved and in trying to help the company create value. And that's, what the, and that's you know, from, from a personal level, that's something I find exciting about, about what I do is it has a bit of an operational kind of component to it as well. Um, but yeah, I guess different, different models, I think, so. It's, it's nice to have a panel discussion where 
uh, you talk about all your successes, but in fact, I think everybody in the room who deploys capital knows that a certain percentage of that, those investments don't work out. And I think when you follow the money through a board seat or otherwise, you have an opportunity to make sure at least you can have a successful unwind or a shot at it, or a shot at it. Um, anyway, any other questions? I have one question of the panel. Uh, what keeps you awake at night in regard to your investments and what are you doing about it to sleep better? I worry that my companies are going to run out of money. <laughs> That's what keeps me up at night. I mean, you know, companies companies are raising you know very large rounds and and putting you know hopefully putting a lot of money in a bank. But then I also see a lot of companies that just spend very frivolously um, and run through it a lot. Every company I, I've I've worked with has run through money faster than they anticipated, which is probably normal. Like no one can really, as I said, those projections are are pretty fuzzy anyway, but um, but I do worry that you know capital may become uh, less available to some of my companies, um, and that they they will not they are not being as efficient um, as they could be with their spending. So I think that's that's my biggest concern right now is whether or not uh, my companies have enough runway to get through whatever is coming. Next, I guess for me it's uh, if we see the next Uber, are we able to see it and then also execute on that? Because we saw Uber when they had like $70 million, but it was a very early on where we were very, uh, I guess, valuation sensitive. <laughs> but uh, 70 million versus 52 billion is a, is a different uh, <laughs> different number, obviously. Um, but you know, being, being able to see and being able to execute on a very great investment, if we know it's a great company, or maybe we don't know, but we still do it, um, that's what keeps me up at night. and. Um, you know, we're putting new processes in place to be a little bit more independent, to be faster and nimbler. Uh, I think the typical stuff, uh, what you can expect from a corporate VC after four years uh, in business. Well, of course you should. Yeah, I, I would echo what my, my panelists, have, co panelists have said as well. I think in, in, in healthcare, you know, the, 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 the ultimate thing that we, we face is a, a clinical risk. And I think that's, you know, kind of the biggest concern for us. And I think. Um, you know, so for example, you know, maybe they're, they're in the midst of a clinical trial, phase two, and then some big toxicity comes up and kills a program. I mean, that, that's, you know, that's a disaster, right? Um, manufacturing is another key area that we, you know, we, we pay attention to because, you know, manufacturing could, you know, delay the trial or, you know, delay the, you know, the commercial uptake or whatever. So I think that those are concerns that, as they kind of keep us up at night, I think the way that we mitigate that is goes back to, you know, it's going to be a broken record, but goes back to the management team and, and having uh, a good management team in place that's going to be able to navigate that, um, anticipate those potential problems. Any final question? Thanks very much for giving us your time. Appreciate it.